Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. Man, we miss you guys, miss seeing your smiling faces. But this week, the staff has had several significant meetings where we've been planning out what it's going to be like when we get back together uh, on, on August the 9th. That's our first Sunday being back in the sanctuary. And, and one of the things that we want to do is we want to be mindful and be wise and, and use proper safety precautions. But we also want that day to be us. We want it to be a, a full worship with, with declarative worship songs and us to be back into the room. And so we've been planning a lot of different things as we're getting ready to come back together. And so this good news, God is moving, hang in there just a little bit longer. We can't wait to see you. The sermon this morning uh, is, is something personal to me that I just want to process, I want to work through. Uh, what happened is the Lord at the beginning of 2020, this was actually December of 2019, the Lord gave me this psalm, Psalm 103, as my anchor scripture for 2020. I had no idea what 2020 was going to look like. I knew that God's goodness was going to guide us and lead us through 2020, but he gave me this scripture, and almost every single day I get up and I read this whole chapter, all of Psalm 103. I read it over my life. And so I've, I've read it, you know, 150 times already so far this year. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to read this passage to you, and then I want to reread it and break it down in points and share some beautiful revelations, some beautiful things that I've been marinating in, and then show it in the light of 2020. Before I do that, I want to take just a second, and I just want to just, just pull out the calendar for just a second. You realize that we are in July of 2020. We're in the second half of 2020. The first half is done. The second half is yet to be written. And I just, in my spirit, I see more and more people getting energy, more and more prophetic words coming forward, more and more uh, uh, the church going on the offensive. It just really feels like the Holy Spirit is guiding us and giving us fresh revelation, and you can feel the momentum picking up for the body of Christ right now. And I just want to say that to you because if you turn on the news, you turn on the TV, you're going to get a lot of fear. I was, I was listening to a preacher say, you need the facts, you just don't need the fear. We need the facts about what's going on. We just don't need the spirit that's coming with those facts that would try to lean us into uh, being isolated, feeling defeated, um, and, and being worried about the future. And so as we start walking out the second half of 2020, we want to release our faith. That's why I preached on faith the last two Sundays. Release our faith get our supernatural assignments, and begin launching out as the church, pushing back the gates of hell. And so I want to read to you Psalm 103, and then I want to walk through and just show you some of the things the Lord has shown to me. Now remember, the Psalms were songs. They were meant to be sung. They were Hebrew songs that were meant to be served in worship. And the Psalm 103 was written by King David. And I, I, one of the things I like about Psalms that were written by King David is we know David. We, we read about David. We see his victories. We see his failures. We see his life. Some of the other folks who wrote the Psalms, we don't know who they are, so it's hard to have context for what they wrote. So as I read 103 to you, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Look for any repetitive themes. Look for anything that looks out of place, like why did he put that in there? Uh, look for David's life to show up in this psalm. What, what, what might be some things that we can pull out of this psalm that tell us more about David's life? And then see if there's anything that the Holy Spirit highlights for you that you might want to make notes about, that you might want to go back and study for yourself. So here we go. Let's read one, Psalm 103. I'm, I'm entitled in this Psalm 103 three, his steadfast love. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. 
For the wind passes over and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will, and bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I just love this psalm. Okay, I'm going to just read some, and I'm going to break it down for you a little and unpack some things. The very first thing that I see is in, in Psalm uh, 103 is verse 1. And, and, and we all know this verse, but I want to look at it a little bit differently. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. It's almost like David is looking outside, looking from outside of his life back at himself and saying, you don't praise God enough. You're not blessing him enough. You're not giving him enough credit for what he's done in your life. It's almost like David's talking to himself and he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is with me. Now that's the revelation for me. For me to bless the Lord, with my soul, okay, I can bless him with my mind by thinking about him. I can bless him with, with, my, with my body by lifting my hands, by clapping my hands, by singing. But your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And, and, and David's saying, every bit of me, my body, my soul, my spirit, you worship the Lord. You bless him. You adore him. Uh, you praise him. And, and as David is saying that, I start thinking about all of me. He says, bless the Lord, all my soul. And I start thinking about all of me. And not all of me is 100% good. Sometimes things are bad in me. And yet David says, no, you bless the Lord with everything you have. Now, one of the things that, that is almost scandalous, I heard Dr. Jim Marks talk about this. And he says when he goes into prayer, he tries to quiet his spirit, quiet his mind, and let Holy Spirit guide him. And he says, even if a bad thought comes into my mind, he says, what do you do with a bad thought when you're in prayer with God? What, do you, what happens if you have an inappropriate, like you want to run over somebody in your car? You think about somebody in prayer, and you want to get in your car and go run them over. He says, you know, the, our first thought is to throw that thought away. But no, why, what, what better time for you to have that thought than while you're in prayer with all of you in front of all of them? And you have an opportunity between, before Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to explain that thought that's rolling around in your heart. It could be. I mean, this is crazy. It could be that while you're blessing the Lord, he allows you to have a bad thought that's always been there so that you bring it out so that he can deal with it right then, right there. So one of the things that I try to talk to people about is you can be angry and still come to God. You can be depressed and still come to God. You can be jealous and still come to God. You, you, you can have hatred in your heart and still come to God. It's the safest place to process all of you in front of all of them. So I love that David says this, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. All right, next chunk. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I'm going I'm to show you in the next slide, and these are five benefits that David had found in his lifetime with the Lord. Ready? He forgives all our iniquity. The most important thing he does is he forgives us of all of our sins. Number two, he heals all of our diseases. Right there, all of our diseases. Three, redeems your life from the pit. You could have totally screwed up your life, found yourself in the pit, and he will redeem you from the pit. Four, he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. And five, satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. I mean, that is amazing. Why do we only preach number one? Why do we only preach he forgives us of our sin? There's so much more to this deal than just forgiving. He forgives our sin. He heals our iniquity. He redeems our life from the pit, crowns us with steadfast love and mercy, and then he renews our strength. So I, as I start thinking about think about David's life, David experiences. He was strong as a young man. He made mistakes in his midlife. He, he, he came back as an older man and, and had more wisdom and more grace. He walked a full life with the Lord. He, he's this man of faith that knew that God wanted to spend time with his people, and he you know, put up the tent at the tabernacle and brought people in to worship God, which was totally against the law. 
But David knew that God wanted a relationship more than he wanted law. And he knew that God wanted to spend time with him. And so David gets this realization, yes, I've sinned, but God's forgiven me of all my iniquity. And he heals all the diseases. He cares about my spirit first, but he cares about my body second. Third of all, I might have found myself in a pit. And if you read some of David's Psalms, you know, he, he's struggling with depression. He's struggling with anger and bitterness. He's dealing with some stuff. He talks about his enemies and how he wants God just to destroy his enemies. And there's a lot going on in David's life. David's been to some pits before. I don't know about you, but if you were a young man and the prophet showed up and said, there's a king in your house and they called all the sons but you, th there's probably some rejection there. When he shows up in the battle line for Goliath and his b older brother treats him shamefully, David had to work through and process some stuff. David dealt with some stuff with his own sons like Absalom. He's been in a pit long enough to know that God is a redeemer of the pit. And then God crowns you with steadfast love and with mercy. That that's who he is. And I like how many adverbs and adjectives he used, like steadfast love. It wasn't just that God crowned you with love. No, it's steadfast love. David's like, man, my life was like this, but God's love is steady all the time. And then he says, and God satisfies you with good and renews your strength like the eagles. I, the older I get, the more I appreciate the ability of the Lord to satisfy us with good stuff and renew our strength like an eagle. And, when, and before we came into 2020, this is the scripture the Lord gave me and said, I want you to marinate in this scripture all year long. And as situation has changed, as circumstances have changed, as things have been uncertain in our society, um, as a person, I have personal views. And then I also have to be responsible for our public views. I have to be careful about what's best for all people in our congregation, not just, you know, with, with me. So I have to be careful. And, and through all this whole thing about when do you open, when do you honor the governor, and when do you not honor the governor? Uh, what is Jesus trying to get at? And is, is he satisfied that he, we got at that? And as we're processing all all this information and dealing with mask and no mask and all those kind of stuff, man, I've held on to the scripture that this is what he does. It's the full package. He doesn't just forgive you of your sins. He wants to redeem your whole life, and he wants your strength renewed, no matter how tired you are. You know, I repented of depression this morning. This morning I was in a group, and I repented for depression. And, and I know, and I don't want to belittle that for anybody else who struggles with chronic depression. Mine's been seasonal. And I said, I'm done. I am done living under this, and I'm going to deal with this in the spirit right now, and I'm going to walk out of this, and I'm going to repent for staying in it as long as I stayed in it. It just was a hard season. Now, some of you struggle with chron uh, you know, chronic depression. I'm not making any judgments for you. In fact, that's the thing that's happening is so many people are want to make a black and white thing for everybody. You know, if you wear a mask, you're bad. If you don't wear a mask, you're bad. If you come back to church, you're bad. If you stay at home, you're bad. It's like there's so many things that we have to have grace for either. This is like a no judgment zone. If you wear a mask, fine. If you don't wear a mask, fine. If you believe in hugging, fine. If you can't hug, fine. We get, this is a time for us to respect each other and each other's perspective and show grace and love, less judgment, less criticism. And I just, there's so many people, we hear about them. They send us emails and say, if you do this, if you don't do this, and I'm like, guys, this, everybody's got their own journey they're walking through. And David's walked with the Lord. And at the end of his life, he can write a psalm and he can say, he's still renewing my strength. He's still redeeming my life. And that's my hope for us as we move forward in the second half of 2020. All right, next passage. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. Now, just real quickly, there's a distinction there that the people of Israel knew his acts. They watched what he did, but Moses understood his ways. And there's a, it's possible that you can see something happen and, and interpret it different ways based on your relationship with the people in that circumstance. And what he's saying here is, David is saying, Israel got to see the acts of God, but Moses looked behind the veil. Moses saw his glory. Moses went up the mountain. Moses spoke with him like a friend speaks to a friend. Moses knew his ways. 
And, and you know, there's a, that quote I use every once in a while that, that young men know the rules, but old men know the exceptions. And, and that's the thing that when we walk with Papa long enough, we, we, we look past the acts and we, we discern his heart and his spirit in what he's doing. But he's always working righteousness. He's always working justice. Those two things you can count on. And here's the thing. Ooh. Um, so the, way, the reason that Papa works justice is to bring people back in right relationship so he can express love. So when people are being dealt with with injustice, they're being prejudice, racism, stuff like that, when there's injustice, he wants to deal with the injustice to reestablish relationship, right relationship, so that love can be exchanged. So anytime we try to mete out justice, but it's not from a spirit of love, we're not doing anybody a favor. All justice must come from a place of love and restored relationship. And if the devil can't get you to stand up for something, that, I'm sorry, if, if, the, if the devil can't get, stop you from standing up for something, he'll push you too far so that you do it from a place that's not of love, but it's a place of domination, hatred, vengeance, re- retribution. So our justice has to come from a place of love. 8 through 12 says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. Just listen to these words about God. Uh, sometimes I turn on the radio. Don't ever turn on AM radio, listen to preaching. That's some, that's some rough stuff. Right? It, I don't know why I said that, but I'm telling you, every time I turn on the AM radio to listen to preaching, it is some banging, banging, banging preaching. And I just don't know how people do that. And, but this, listen, this is Papa. This is Papa we're talking about. The Lord is merciful. And gracious, he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast, bounding, overflowing. You can't, he just can't keep it in. It's abounding in steadfast love. Have you figured it out yet? Steadfast love is used four times in this this whole chapter, four times. Steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. He doesn't repay us according to our sins. He doesn't deal with us according to our iniquities. He dealt with Jesus according to our iniquities. He dealt with another man according to our iniquities so he didn't have to deal with us. That's not the relationship. It's not based around sin. The relationship is based around love. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love. So high. So where we are today... We can't even see where he is. We can't even see his realm. We can't even see his throne without a supernatural vision to go there. As high as his throne is above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. You know, I've been thinking a lot about fear, and this this word right here, to fear God, means to show reverence, that we are to reverence God. And I I tend to find that that to the level we fear God, or the lack of level we fear God is the level we fear other things. The greater your fear of God, the greater your reverence of God, the less room you have to fear anything else. The more you fill your eyes with the reverence of the throne of God and you hold him in the regard that he deserves, the less room there is for anything else in your life for you to be fearful of. So he says, as far as the east is from the west, You can't go east enough to get to the west, and you can't go west enough to go to the east. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Now, you got to remember, David was in adultery. David murdered one of his mighty guys. David numbered the the, the people, which caused a plague, and, and, and Israelites were killed by the thousands. There was things that David did, and in all that, David doesn't run from that. David stands there and says, and yet God, and yet God. God is so merciful and gracious and slow to anger, abounding in love, removing my sin from his east is from the west. His, his throne above the earth is so great as his steadfast love towards me. David had an, a, a relationship and an intimacy with God that few ever had on this earth probably why the Lord promised him that one of his sons would always sit on the throne. And, and that's what happened. 
And then verse 13 through 18 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Pause there for a second. I find this interesting that he doesn't say, As a mother shows compassion to her children, so the Lord shows compassion. I would have thought that. I would have thought, you know, as I've mulled over this over the year, I'd say moms have lots of compassion for their kids. But dads, their compassion has a purpose to it. <laughs> their, their compassion, they show compassion, but it's got a lesson. They show compassion, but they're building for the future. Um, Tina and I, when we raised our kids, we believed in spankings. And, and Caleb got like five spankings his entire life. He just, he did not need spankings. He was just well-mannered. Certain look was all you had to give him. He would change his mind. He was good. Hayden Luke, our youngest, he would get five spankings a day. I mean, he, he, he was just a whole different animal. He, he, he set out to prove to me that he was going to break me and, and just had such a strong spirit, such a strong spirit. And uh, so we would talk. <laughs> so when I would spank him, we would talk about that I'm grooming him for greatness, so he would do something wrong. He says, you're going to groom me for greatness, aren't you? <laughs> He's going to get a spanking. But to, even to this day, he'll say something about grooming for greatness. And, um, and by the way, he does not regret any of those spankings because the Lord worked in him through those things, discipline. And, and, and if you are one of those parents that says, I just do not believe in spanking your children, that's fine. The Bible says that parents are to discipline their children. You don't have to spank them. You still have to discipline them. We're still all responsible for disciplining our kids. And it's sad when you're in an environment where an undisciplined kid ruins the experience for everybody. So it's important we have to discipline our kids. We don't want the law to have to be the ones to discipline them some part in their life. For he knows our frame. This is the piece. David is processing this. And he says, he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over and it's gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. And in this passage right here, we don't know when David wrote this psalm, but most theologians believe it was later in his life because of passages like this. An older man would sit and think about, God knows my frame and remembers, but I'm dust. He knows that I'm like a flower that grows, the wind blows over, and it passes, and it's gone. And, and older men think about the longevity of their life. They think about uh, how short life is and the frailty of life. They, they would take note and, and, and think, be thankful for what God's given them, but also have some urgency. And then he flips, and he starts talking about that God, that his steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting. And then talks about how God shows righteousness to children's children. So watch what's happening here. David is saying, my, my frame is frail. My life is short. I, I budded for a season, but the wind has blown, and it's not long until I'm gone. And in the same breath then, he looks to God and says, but you are from everlasting to everlasting. My life might be short, but you are from everlasting to everlasting, and you show righteousness to children's children. So he sees the, the breath of God, but then he sees the depth of the generations behind him. And in this beautiful moment, David is considering the shortness of his life, but then in the context of an everlasting God who deals with us generationally. And David finds solace in knowing that the things that God began in David, he will finish in his sons and grandsons. That his life did matter. His life might have been shorter than the, than the dreams he had to accomplish, but he can trust God because the God that created him put the dreams there also gave him kids and grandkids that can finish up the dreams that he had desired to do. This is a beautiful passage right here. And then the last part, the very last passage says this, the Lord has established his throne, in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And I just want to point out like four or five things in this last passage. He ends with bless the Lord, O my soul, exactly where he started. He started with bless the Lord, O my soul, and he's going to finish with bless the Lord, O my soul. Everything in between is appropriate. We come to the Father and we say, Papa, I come to you honestly and truthfully. Have your conversation. And then end with, Papa, I came with you, to you honestly and truthfully. Or I come to you to be with you because I love you. And, I want, and if he brings something up, 
Trust him that this is important and he wants to deal with this thing, but you can trust him. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, and everything in between makes sense. The other thing I see in this passage is he talks to three different groups of people. He says, bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word. Then he says, bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers, that's the cloud of witnesses, that's the created beings, that's man, that's the, I'm sorry, that's the heavenlies, that's the created beings and the heavenly host, his ministers who do his will. Then he says, bless the Lord, all his works. That's creation, that's us, that's all creation. So he says, angels, hosts and, and creative beings, earth and humans, everyone, bless the Lord in this crescendo. Everyone, come together and bless the Lord. Okay, so I'm going to stay here for just five minutes and just have a, a, a conversation with you. I believe in this season what's getting ready to happen in the next six months. We're going to see more supernatural than we've ever seen before. His throne is lifted high. His throne is lifted high, and his kingdom covers all. In the second half of this year, I know there's prophetic words that there could be danger, there could be trouble, and even in that, his kingdom will advance. I, and, and I still believe that some of those circumstances can be changed based on what his church does. I think the church is the time clock. The church is the dictating factor of what's going to happen. I do not believe it's the election that's going to make that decision. Is the election important? Yes. I believe what the church does in November is more important than who we elect in November. And that's any election. That's not just for president. It's time for the church to rise up. I believe his his throne has been established. His kingdom rules over all. I've been asking Papa for more angelic visitations, more angelic activity in our lives. He, he created angels to do his work, to do his bidding. We have the ball. We as, as humans are the ones on the field. We're the ones speaking truth. We're either talking about fear or we're declaring the kingdom. We're either responding to the world or we're speaking from the heavenly realm. We are, have the ball. We're on the field. And his angels and created beings are created to minister to him and to help us do his will. That's what they were created to do. So I'm like, Papa, I need more help from my angels. And I'm sure I'm the problem, not to my angels. But I'm like, hey, teach me how to do what I'm supposed to do so that the angelic beings can, can do your will through my life. And, 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 then, and then also I'm, I'm looking at how do we come together as kingdom people? It seems like Papa took us out of our individual churches and wanted us to be the church not be part of a, just be part of a church. And so as part of this new thing is, what kingdom advancement are we going to do that's not up to one church? It's not because of you belong to this church or you belong to that church, but because you belong to the kingdom, because you belong to the family. And so I believe there's going to be more supernatural, uh, more angelic, more kingdom cooperation. And these are the kind of things these are the kind of things that can advance the kingdom in such a forceful way that the enemy has to give up strongholds and unbelievers are wowed at the demonstrations of love that the church is doing in this time and age. And so one of the things that's really important right now is unity. And, and that's why there's like 12 controversies going on right now, whether it's come back, listen to the governor, mask, anti-racial stuff, the politics, the election. There are so many things right now. Blue lives, black lives, all this stuff is happening right now. And people are taking a subject they're passionate about and saying, if you don't agree with me, and I'm saying to you, that's the scheme of the devil. That's the scheme of the devil to give you a strong burden that's so strong in you that you judge other people over your burden. And we got to be really careful in this season that if God convicts you of something and speaks to you about something, praise the Lord. Don't let the devil push you too far that everybody that disagrees with you is now a devil, a demon, or your enemy. And in this season, God has is, is broken down some walls. It's been uncertain. It, it's been challenging trying to process all the information and pray and, and sit with the staff and elders and decide on how do we do this and how do we do that? How do we honor the Lord? How do we honor the government? How do we honor uh, our church? How do we honor everybody? And these are the things that we're looking at. But I think the second half of 2020, uh, that first half, nobody saw coming. The second half, let's open our eyes. Let's come awake. Let's, let's get our, our strength back inside of us. Let's get back in the word. Let's we'll start declaring the word of God. Let's walk by faith. Let's, let's rise up, church. Let's repent of our sins. Let's pray. Let's worship God. This, this is a moment right here. You know, 
we may look back one day from heaven. We might get to see a video reel of our lives. And, and, and then and there'll be like, you know, the special Saturday night, you know, w- w- once a year on Saturday night, the special Saturday night, we're going to watch this, you know, the, the craziest movie of all time called 2020. And, and we're going to sit there and we're going to watch everything that happened. And, and, and you know what's going to happen? When we're watching that movie, we're suddenly going to start praising God, giving him glory, giving him honor for all he did in 2020. It'll be easy to praise God from a throne in heaven as we look back and watch it. But can we praise him right now? The, the question is, can we praise him right now? Can we find our voice, our song? Can we lift our hands? Can we declare his, his value, his worth, his power, his authority, his goodness over our lives in this season? Because this is the moment that we have to give him worship. This is the moment that we have to walk by faith. This is the moment to rise up, join together, and advance the kingdom of God. 20, the second half of 2020, I, I think we're going to see a lot of important stuff a lot of important stuff. And I think we're going to have to be really conscious. We have to be prayed up. We have to be walking by faith. We need to be walking in the supernatural. And we need each other. This is not a time to isolate yourself. We need each other. And so I'm encouraging us to do that. So this is Psalm 103. This is what the Lord gave me, uh, his steadfast love. And so all year long, I've had some good days. I've had some bad days. I've accomplished a couple goals. I had to rip up about eight of my goals. I had to start over and put together some new goals. I, I, it's been the craziest season, as you you guys know, but this one chapter in the Bible, I've just read over and over and over again. And when I look at David, probably from an older place in his life, in the end, he says, God is good. In every season of my life, God has been good. And, it's, and he's, he's gooder than I even thought he was. I know that's not a word. He's gooder than I even thought he was. He, he, he is, as far as his throne is above the earth, so great is his steadfast love for me. If you're watching this today and you have a sin-based relationship with God or you don't even know God, I want to say to you, his steadfast love is abounding for you, is overwhelming for you. His desire to be in relationship with you and for you to know how much he loves you and how much he desires you is overwhelming. For those of us who have experienced it, have walked in it through the highs and the lows, it's the greatest gift we could, were ever given, and we just want you to have that gift. So I'm going to pray right now for all of us, but particularly if you don't know this love that Jesus has for you, I'm going to pray that he would show up and he would give you that. It, it, by the way, if you're skeptical about a relationship with Jesus, if you're skeptical that there even is a God, All I'm asking you to do is simply say, if there is a God, I would like to know him. That's it. If there is a God, I give you permission to introduce yourself to me. If you simply give God permission to introduce himself to you, he will introduce himself to you in a unique way he's not done with anybody else. You'll know it's real. You'll, you'll understand how intimate, how perfect it is. I'm just asking, just give him permission to introduce himself to you, and he will. Let's pray. So, Papa, right now, I just lift you up over this earth, over the pandemics, over the racial revolution, over the elections and politics and all the stuff we've been Your throne is established in the heavenlies. Your kingdom rules over all. You have declared your word. You have empowered your sons and daughters. And we are here today to do your will and to serve you on the earth in this season. So as I've spoken today, Father, you've been stirring in some people's hearts. And if there are people out there that do not know you, I'm asking right now that you would introduce yourself to them in a very unique and special way. I'm asking that love, you would go to them and love, you would start a relationship with them in such a way that they would know it is true and real and they would feel the love of God come upon them. And then, Lord, that you would raise them out of the pit, crown them with steadfast love and mercy, And Lord, renew their strength so that they can be what you've always created them to be. I'm asking for that right now in Jesus' name. If there are Christians out there who have a a law-based relationship with God, then I'm asking you that you would move them from that to a love-based relationship. That they would see how great your mercy and your kindness is for their life because it's your goodness that leads us to repentance. It's your goodness that causes us to make adjustments to want to walk with you and be with you. 
So, Father, we, I ask you to do that. There are many Christians that are living under legalism. They're living under a heavy law. They're living under this heavy right and wrong, and they think you're mad at them and you're angry at them and that you're, you're just waiting to punish them, and that's not who you are. You're a God of love. You're a God of, of grace. You're a God of that you do discipline your children because you love your children, but the way you correct your children is not out of anger. It's out of, it's out of love for them to have the best for their lives. And for all of us, Father, I pray that our eyes would be trained on the heavens, our eyes would be trained on faith, our eyes would be looking for the supernatural and angelical uh, in, uh, visitations, and that, Lord, that this would be a supernatural end of 2020, and we would see the church overcoming, the church advancing, and the world in awe of who you are. We pray this right now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, I bless you in Jesus' name. I bless you to have a great day today, but I also bless you with a, the, the emotions to feel and perceive God's love for you in a fresh way this week. Don't forget to go on newcovenantchurch.com, click on the connect button if you'd like to leave us a prayer request, and if you want one of our altar ministers to call you, make sure when you click on the connect button, you leave your phone number. God bless you guys. Have a great week.